By the end of this video, you will have a complete understanding of how to successfully trade leveraged ETFs. The analogy that I like to make with these is basically like taking a cat, if say you have a house cat and spiking its food with say, caffeine or an illicit drug that's against YouTube's monetization policies. What would happen is that your once stable, boring house cat is now bouncing back and forth across the room, meowing and yapping everywhere, and twitching from ear to ear. In other words, Little Whisker Man is very excited and this perhaps makes the cat more fun to play with, but it's also substantially more dangerous for the cat. So the leveraged ETF basically works in the same way. It takes an underlying asset and it multiplies its movements extensively. This allows you to have fun with the fluctuations, but it also comes with some drawbacks. One of the most notable drawbacks is of course the decay factor. Because of the multiplication effect of a leveraged ETF, they do end up decaying over the long run. But in any case, the leveraging multiplication effect is very beneficial for us. This is because as traders, we need the volatility to trade off of, and these often provided in slow markets, as well as, of course, in more fun markets. But we also want some level of consistency, and one of the biggest problems that traders have is that they have a hard time being consistent, trading a bunch of different stocks and a bunch of different ETFs and a bunch of different sectors. But using leveraged ETFs generally allows a lot of people, especially beginners, to provide that original consistency in growing their accounts. So with that being said, before I get more into it, all I ask in return for spiking your house cat is that you hit that beautiful and astounding like button. And also don't forget to subscribe if you see value in the following video. So the leveraged ETF is an important tool because it dramatically increases the percentage return we can get compared to trading the regular underlying ETF. If you wanted to trade SPY or any other S&P 500 index tracker, but felt that the movements were too small to trade off of, you could instead trade a leverage ETF version of it, like UPRO, which multiplies the movements of the S&P 500 by three. That means if SPY goes up by 1%, UPRO goes up by 3%. And if SPY goes down by 1%, UPRO goes down by 3%. That is basically leveraged ETFs in a nutshell. But another technical benefit that most leveraged ETFs have is the ability to trade the inverse. For example, if you want to trade natural gas, you have the option of trading leveraged ETFs such as UGAS and DGAS. UGAS multiplies the movements of natural gas by three, and DGAS is the inverse, and that multiplies the movements of natural gas by negative three. So if natural gas goes up by 1%, DGAS goes down by 3%. And if natural gas goes down by 1%, DGAS goes up by 3%. So in this way, UGAS and DGAS are sort of counterparts. One's the inverse of the other. But the beauty of this is that it allows you to take a bearish position on a trade without having to go through the process of actively shorting a stock through your broker. But the value with this is that a lot of these tend to move in a much more consistent rhythm as compared to trading say individual stocks. I'm going to compare and contrast these at the end but let's first dive into how to actually trade them. So to start what are the best ETFs to trade? Well this rotates of course based on what time of the year and what type of market condition we're in but take natural gas for example. Natural gas tends to be more volatile during October through December. But generally speaking, you are going to want to focus on the ETFs that provide at least a decent percentage of volatility per day. If you pull up the watch list pinned to the top of the Zip Trader Circle Facebook group, you can see the ETFs that I'm focusing on during that current time period. But the first great example I'm going to give is Gush. Gush tracks and leverages oil and gas and is quite a good time because of the fact that it provides us the bouncing pattern that we love to trade off of. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Taking entry points is always a game of upward versus downward potential though. If you were to take a position at support, you can further increase your odds of success by making sure there is a lot of longer upward potential. This is a good example of longer upward potential. However, it should be noted that long-term upward potential with leveraged ETFs isn't the same as it is with trading stocks. This is because ETFs have a long-term decay based on the multiplication effect, which systematically pushes it down in the long run. This is something that trips up a lot of people, but it's actually pretty easy to explain. If you have a $100 ETF that goes down $10 or 10% and a leveraged version of that that multiplies it by three times that goes down $30 or 30% because that's three times. After the dip, if the regular ETF returned 10%, that regular ETF would now be at $99. But the leveraged ETF that multiplies the movement, if it returned the 10%, that means the leveraged ETF would return 30%, and 30% would only put it at $91. So now we can already see a decay and a disparity between the two. So this in effect leads leveraged ETFs to decay over the long run, but that isn't something that you need to worry as much about in the short term. Nonetheless, a lot of folks don't realize this, and then just sort of hold and hope, but the odds of success go down every single day that you're holding it because of the simple fact that you do have a decay in the long run. 
Okay, so Lab U and Lab D also provide a decent amount of volatility. The sell-off pattern on Lab U can be taken advantage of with its inverse ETF Lab D, allowing us to buy in at confirmation and ride the price strength over the SMA line. We also have a comeback pattern of overbuying and overselling, which allows us to buy in near oversold entry points and sell out at overbought. This uptrend gives us the overall upper direction, which is important for improving our odds of success. On the flip side, Lab D also provides the comeback pattern, but doesn't have the direction pointing us in the correct way. The reason that I mention this is because on some days we'll see Lab U having the correct direction, and on others we'll see Lab D having it. The beautiful thing about having an inverse ETF pair is that we can easily take advantage of any movement. Okay, so let's go over JNUG. Now, JNUG multiplies the movements of gold, the gold miners ETF, by three times. This is excellent because it not only has a pattern of running over the SMA line, but also has a pattern of overbuying and overselling. And the running over the SMA line is important because it allows us to buy in at confirmation and ride the SMA line up and then sell out at validation. This allows us to not only enter in with the RSI in our favor, but also to grab better entry and exit points and better monitor the price strength and weakness. As we know, upwards price action moving away from the SMA line is a sign of price strength, whereas price action moving closer to it, well, that's a sign of price weakness. A lot of people complain in the comment section or they send me messages asking me why my trading style is so repetitive. Trading gains are one in consistency, they're not one in complicating everything. That being said, honestly, my trading style really isn't that simple. Each individual step is very easy to implement, but putting everything together can really be a challenge for a lot of people. I also use a lot of fundamental analysis with a lot of sectors of the stocks that I trade, especially the biotech sector. But the beauty with leveraged ETFs is that there's not a whole lot of fundamental analysis that's really that applicable. Um, but anyway, since we are on JNUG, I should also mention Dust. Now, Dust is the leveraged short index on gold, effectively an inverse of JNUG. Now, it's not an exact inverse, and I know some people are going to pick that up, but they both hold gold as the underlying asset. So, in effect, it's very similar, and they perform in an inverse way. But in any case, we see that we can take advantage of these dips from uptrends again and again while having the upward trend direction that we love. Now, TQQQ is another one. This is one of the most popular leverage ETFs out there. It is basically a leveraged version of Triple Q, which is basically a tech-focused offshoot of the S&P 500. This one tends to have pretty good run-ups as well, but they do perform a little dirtier. They tend to not have that clean run-up above the SMA line, but rather have breakdowns amongst the price strength. If you were to take advantage of buying in at oversold and selling at it overbought, you need to set your validation or selling out point a little less conservatively in order to take advantage of that. But in any case, there are actually a lot of leverage ETFs out there. And this video really only focused on some of the best opportunities that I see in the current market. If you'd like to learn more, you could simply use Google and Google search a list of the top leverage ETFs to trade. The things I would look for are high volume, high volatility, and inverse pairs. But my suggestion when you're piling through the list is to not discount ETFs that are plummeting because again, you could just trade the inverse pair if it has an inverse pair. Okay, so with that being said, should you focus on trading leverage ETFs or should you focus on trading individual stocks or should you trade a combination of the two? Well, the argument with trading leverage ETFs is that if you can recognize and learn how several leverage ETFs trade, you could hypothetically just focus on those and stay consistent. In fact, some people just trade one leverage ETF and trade that as well as its inverse, and that is like their entire trading inventory and that works for them. A lot of people feel that trading a lot of different things in different sectors makes it hard to be consistent since you are working a bunch of different markets and with a bunch of different underlying variables. Personally, I do think that there is some truth to this argument, sort of the jack of all trades but master of none, but like with anything, it's really up to the individual. I like to trade a bunch of different sectors because I find only trading leverage ETFs to be too boring. And when things get boring, I tend to perform worse and make less money overall. Thus, in my personal trading, I tend to follow any part of the market that provides the volatility that we need to trade off of. Sometimes that means trading leverage ETFs. Sometimes that means trading biotech. Sometimes that means trading marijuana stocks. Sometimes that means trading big mainstream tech stocks. But whatever it is, I focus on trading stocks that have the volatility that we need to trade off of. All right, folks, I didn't really touch that much on natural gas, and I know that's a huge topic of interest for a lot of people, but luckily I did make a video on that a couple months ago, and I'll put a link in the description below to that video. We, of course, also have many resources available for you. We have a great trading tutorials playlist, 
We have the Zip Trader Circle Facebook group, and we now have a Discord chat as well. These are all great resources that you could use to immediately start learning about investing and trading within the stock market. As always though, make sure to practice all your strategies before you actually go into the market. Learning how to trade is not easy. So practice in a risk-free way, such as using on-demand trading or by paper trading. And when you do start trading, make sure to always have a plan. This is not a place for little boys and girls who hold in hope. With that being said, have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.